And good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to our 2021 programme of professorial and public lectures. This lecture series is intended to showcase the research and professional expertise of our academic community. In the coming months, the lectures will cover a range of topics intended to challenge our understanding of topical issues, as well as bringing new knowledge into the public arena. Solent has a long history of delivering events that provide a platform for our academics to exchange knowledge with our communities. Research and knowledge exchange are core to our purpose as a university. And events like today provide a key opportunity for us to come together, share insights, explore new ideas, and we hope inspire you to discover more. Whilst today we're limited to a virtual gathering, I am very much looking forward to when we can once again come together in person to explore a diverse range of topics that really matter to our society. I'm delighted today to launch the series with a lecture from Professor Shamantak Bhattacharya, our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Exchange. The lecture is entitled Globalization and the Relationships Between State, Employer and Labour. The lecture will build on Shamantak's research interests, which are focused on the management of occupational health and safety within the wider context of globalization, the sociology of work, and the roles played by regulators, employers, workers, trade unions, and supply chains. Shamantak has published a number of research papers on this topic in a range of peer-reviewed journals covering employee and industrial relations. And he has also been funded by the European Agency for Safety, Health and Work and the International Transport Workers Federation to undertake a number of research projects on this topic. In 2004, Professor Bhattacharya won the Nippon Foundation Fellowship from the Seafarers International Research Centre at the University of Cardiff. And last year, he was very proud to receive the Hind Ratan Award, India's top civilian award for expatriates in recognition of his exceptional contribution to maritime education and research. In today's lecture, Shumantak, a professor of maritime management, will be presenting the challenges of governing a globalized industry. He will outline some of the enablers of globalization and will also use the global maritime sector as a critical case study to explore the ways in which regulations are currently changing his industry. So without further ado today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Bhattacharya, who will deliver today's professorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Karen. I start by sharing my screen. I need a note just to ensure that the screen is being shared. Thank you very much. So, um, Thank you again, uh, Vice Chancellor, and hello, everyone. It, it gives me great joy uh, to see so many of you. And of course, um, I wish we were all in the Palmerston Lecture Theatre in our university meeting face to face, but we're not letting this pandemic come in the way of our academic discussion. Uh, I come with a background from the industry, having spent 15 years there and another 17 years in academia. So I have always tried to make uh, the connection between the practice and the theory. So as the Vice Chancellor pointed out, research makes uh, a university a uh, university. And here in Solent University, we have a number of areas where we excellent research. We ask the question, the whys, the hows, and the why nots. And, and, and we add to the existing knowledge, challenge the convention, and remind ourselves the fundamentals and macro issues that affect us all. So I, today we are discussing what happens when the traditional role of state using the territorial arrangement 
of regulating workplaces is disturbed. In the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to present both my findings from my own research, as well as what I have studied from the literature over the years. First, we have to have a view on globalization. It has been interpreted in various ways, but for the purpose of this lecture, it would be useful if we stick to the common economic form of globalization, which states that globalization takes place when an economic activity transcends national borders for availing resources, increasing efficiencies, or accessing markets with the aim to grow profit and or reduce expenses. So here are some examples of globalization as you can see on the screen. If you look at the Nike's production base, I think it's phenomenal. It goes right across the world from Vietnam to Argentina and the business model for Apple for producing their products in different parts of the world isn't too dissimilar either. Then there is a more traditional example of exporting products by United States based iron ore companies. And there's one example at the bottom about um, call centers. So there are all different forms of economic activity where uh, successfully uh, globalization has taken place. We now take the example of shipping. And, and, and let us be clear here that just because ships trade internationally between continents does not make the industry a globalized one. Something else does. Because we agreed uh, that the reason an industry or a company is globalized is when it successfully exploits resources, and resources of all, of all kinds, we have to stick to that and see how maritime industry falls in that category. We need to look at the maritime industry slightly differently and not just as a trading vehicle. The industry has mastered the art of utilizing resources transcending national borders for increasing efficiencies to grow profit and reduce expenses. The extent to which it has done so is remarkable. And let us see how. My presentation is divided into three sections. In the first section, I demonstrate the structural change to the global maritime industry that has made globalization possible. In this slide, you can see that the shipping has been growing relentlessly. If you see compared to 1985, the volume of trade has grown by more than 2.6 times between 1985 and now. Some of you may ask, is it connected, is it, is it a reflection of the growth in, in global population? I can tell you that the interim population growth has been one and a half times. So this is not only a reflection of global population growth. This is clearly an example of a consequence of globalization that the industry has experienced. We now turn to the employers. And I wanted to show you how from the list of ship owners that we have uh, in the world, um, where do the ship owners actually come from? So this ship owner's domicile, and I have circled the countries in red to show where these countries are. Most of these countries are identified as traditional maritime nations. And on your screen, you can see that the top 10 nations with the ship owners are circled. So these are the ship owners domicile. However, while that is the case, it is interesting to observe where the top 10 ship owners actually decide to register the ships. Now, in an everyday industry, it would be, it would be strange concept to imagine that you can have an industry somewhere and choose to register your, ship, your, your asset somewhere else. This is how the shipping industry actually qualifies as an one extreme example 
which, which makes it a critical case for us to study. On this slide, it shows the top 10 ship domicile countries are listed at the bottom, as you can see, starting from Greece and ending in USA. And then, and you can see that the main registries are listed in that uh, colored blocks. So if you take the example of Greek ship owners, they choose to run their ship by registering them in places such as Malta, Liberia, and Marshall Island. Likewise, if you take Jap the Japanese example, they seem to have a special affinity for Panama. So these countries, the Panama and the Malta, etc., have been called open registries, or in some cases, pejoratively, as the flags of convenience. But because a ship is a moving asset, renaming and reflagging are relatively straightforward task compared to other industry sectors. That sort of freedom isn't going to be that simple as most industry enter a market and endure a sunk cost or some form of a commitment. But in the case of shipping, it is relatively light. The photos on this slide do the talking. Here you can see that flags can get changed, names can get changed, and they do it with one person repainting them on the sides of his 50 million asset that can be moved from one nation to another nation with relative ease. This doesn't really happen very often in other sectors. In the next slide, I have indicated the nations where which are the leading nations where the ships are registered. And here I've highlighted with blue. These are the top nations where ships are registered in. And the little dot in the Pacific Ocean is Marshall Island, which I actually had to look up to brush up my geography knowledge. Um, so just a, just a note of clarification, the IMO uh, assimilates the views um, and concerns and promotes regulations at sea through nation states. And the nation states apply the regulation. The so ships in effect are extension of nation states. So the law of the state is applied on the ship that flies its flag. So a lot of discussion has taken place on flags of convenience, but in brief, the key point is that these open registries are chosen commonly because they offer reduced regulatory stringency, costs of regulation, benefits of taxation laws, allowing foreigners to register their ships in the country, and also allowing the registered ships to employ seafarers from almost any nation with little emphasis on employment relations. The change that started in the 1970s, uh, by the 1980s, it was accelerating. I love to point out here where the Panama and Japan story started roughly at the same point in terms of dead weight, that is the cargo ca carrying capacity of the world as a percentage of share, around about 9%. Look the way Japan has gone and see the way Panama has gone. What do, these, what do these mean for those who run the ships, the seafarers? So now we turn to the seafarers. The increased trade mean that there is need for new seafarers. It is indeed a good news. As you can see on this slide, the future outlook in red indicates an ever increasing demand for qualified ships officers. As you can see between 2015 to 2020 and 2025, the demand has been on the rise. But I think it's fair to ask the question, where exactly are the ship owners looking for the new seafarers? Again, I go back to my um, world map and I show you here in black circles, you can see the top six seafaring labor supply nations from around the world. 
So we have seen the structural change that had quite a profound change in the industry. The fragmentation of the industry is evident. There are some statistics here just to make the point. From what used to be a family owned ships being flagged in its own country and operated by offices in the, own, in the same country and run by seafarers from the same country now looks very different. Now ship owners choose to register their ships away from where they are domiciled and by so doing they have the freedom to choose their seafarers from where they like and along the way they get someone to manage it for on their behalf. In the next slide I really must put them together using an example. I could not find a better example than the one where I take the example of the Greek shipping industry. As you can see, the green line indicates the growth of ship ownership by Greeks, which is clearly on the rise and in fact shows a phenomenal growth in the last 35 years. In the same period, the ships registered by the blue line, you can see that they barely, barely change the position. So you refer that to the left hand side and you can see that the, the, the Greek numbers stay more or less the same as far as the registries are concerned. As so you remember from one of my earlier slides, nearly 90% of Greek ship owners are registered in four countries, Panama, Malta, Liberia, and Marshall Island. What is even more interesting is to observe what happened to the seafarers. Now here we take the example of the, uh, the one on the red, and we can see what's on the red on the right hand side scale. You will need to see that you will see that, um, that the red graph on the right hand side have dwindled phenomenally to a quarter of its value during the same period while the ship ownership in the same country went up three times. So what exactly is happening here? So in a crude way, one can say that the Greek ship owners chose to register the ships in a foreign country so as not to employ their compatriots on board. There could be a counter argument. Some ship owners in Greece might say that they were compelled to move away their registries to third party flag states because of the poor availability of domestic seafarers. However, researchers and academic studies do not support this theory. Now for the slide that you have been waiting for, I put all those three colors of so red, blue and black on one single global map and you can see the likes of Greece and Germany and Norway and the United States and, 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 and Japan and South Korea are where the, the, the wealth resides. The blue ones are actually a stepping stone to get the seafarers from those circled in black. So the blue ones typically are the Liberia and the Panama and, and you can see the Malta and the Marshall Island. And the black one's really where the seafaring workforce comes from. So it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's Indonesia, Philippines, and Russia, India, China, and Ukraine. So in a way, we can see that there has been growth. And as a result of globalization, what was once the hegemony of a few nation states, typically in the Western world, has now spread to the rest of the world. So that must be a good thing. Well, my question is, or is it? So now I move to the second section, which talks about the impacts of such massive change in the sector. So very roughly then, 
we could separate the three types of nations affected by this restructuring and the three types of impact they experience. So one is the traditional maritime nations, which had the infrastructure to run the ships and provide the pipeline of trained uh, and educated seafarers. They, of course, found themselves in a bit of a strange situation as the ships moved away from their registry and their seafarers lost out. So that's group one. Then there's the middle one, is the new flag states, which almost overnight had to determine ways to regulate and clearly provide uh, providing the same level of stringency was not their business model because they had to promote growth. And, and, the, key, and, and the one key point that uh, was, was that they, they, they had to offer a reduced stringency for employment practices. That indeed was a source of attraction for a significant proportion of ship owners. And finally, on the right hand side, these are the new labor supply nations. They, 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 these states here found a new income source, repatriated salary for some nations uh, uh, were, was a good source of foreign direct investment and grew the nation's GDP. But uh, there were questions raised about their protection or indeed in the quality of the training and education. In the next slide, Just want to ask, so, so what, what, what if we find from the various studies is the extent of fragmentation in the industry, which is profound and irreversible. With change of ownership, we find newer types of owners who may not have been into shipping, newer breeds of ship managers who offered support to the new ship owners, and newer sources of seafarers from countries that haven't had a long history of training and educating seafarers in that scale. Of course, with that came the questionable employment practices, poor workplace facilities, and more, which include not only cheap labor, but the savings that came from beyond the salaries. So just to illustrate the point, you know, you can see what probably was the case before to what it has been in terms of the owner, the regulator, and finally, the seafarers. Of course, the picture on the right hand top corner is from Wasash, but I'm sure that would be the case for all UK providers. I think it's only fair that we take a deeper look at the impact of seafarers here. So what exactly are we seeing here? So you can see that some of the striking comments here and seafarers from uh, a country X do not just land up on a ship. It's the ship owners who choose to get regulated by certain open registries. And it is they who award the contract to manning agents and decide on the nationalities and the employment practices. A number of studies have determined the impact of such change in the sector has been quite, in some cases, shocking. There's some evidences you can see of poor employment relations, in some cases, even abuse. And studies show that these are more prevalent when the evil nexus of new types of ship owners and flags of convenience and exploitable labor come together. From the list, you can see how the industry press routinely reports uh, the poor employment practices of seafarers. It has been mentioned that roughly 10 to 15 percent probably work in slave conditions, while if fair trade were to be introduced with the shipping as part of its trade journey, then the seafarers would, in many cases, feature as the weakest link in the entire fair trade business, weaker than the planters and the fruit pickers. I want to now turn to the health and safety, occupational health and safety, and how it all, all, all affects the workplace health and safety. It is. It is an area I have carried out some, some research in shipping and, and, and dock sector and coal mines. Um, and, and, and the findings here tell you a quite a painful story. This is a sector where data is difficult to get hold of, remember. But wherever you look, there's a clear evidence that shows that when compared to shore-based industries, seafarers suffer 
from a higher level of fatality, injury, and ill health concerns. All these figures are troublesome. And we have to remember that all these figures are despite healthy worker effect and without overseas hospitalization data in some cases. So if you see Pukala and Sarnis, you can see that the skin cancer, mesothelioma, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, all are more, right? heart disease are more likely to happen compared to their uh, show-based counterparts. I now, I now want to present a table to you. This table is what I have put together drawing from a number of studies, some of which are over 100 years old. It clearly tells you a story. Just for clarification, the MD, which indicates maritime disaster, means the losses resulting from a total catastrophic loss, such as foundering of a ship due to major fire or flooding, for whatever reason, which affects the entire ship. And the OA, on the other hand, is the occupational accidents, which means that a single or a small group of seafarers on a ship have met with fatalities as a result of some incident on their ship. Now the latter could be compared, the OA could be compared with any other business in the world, such as a mechanical plant or a chemical factory or even, even a construction site. What do we see here? We can see the proportion of maritime disaster over occupational accidents has been changing, which means that while Maritime disaster used to take more lives than occupational accident. Now it is the other way around. That means the ships have indeed become safer as they are built, now built stronger and better. They, they are able to withstand the weather better and, and, and have better satellite communication and so on. But when it comes to occupational accidents, it reveals a problem. And this is a problem, is in the weak management issues. Arguably, all these occupational accidents are preventable had there been better management, better employment standards. I hope I've made myself clear here. What used to be more than one has now definitely dropped to less than one, and that's the point I'm making. I want to take it one notch further now. The matter actually gets worse when I, when I show you uh, that by drawing on the data from ILO and ITF, and Mission to Seafarers, how roughly 10 to 15% of the global seafarers face the poorest of treatment, which includes abundant seafarers. The example I point out are a small selection of a very, very big problem. I hope you can see that table and if you can if you see it carefully you will see that these incidents take place in all parts of the world from Constanza in Europe to Taichu in Asia and Lome in Africa and even one close to home in Shields in South Shields. So what is the pattern here? What am I trying to say? I really urge you to look at the uh, tables more carefully. You'll see that the flags are all open registry. And some would say they are the flags of convenience. In a couple of cases here, you can see that I do not even know what the flags are. Now, that is very difficult for me to explain, or anybody to explain. The first top line here, you can see, are post-COVID. And it's not only a COVID crisis issue that has led to the abandonment of the sea, seafarers since this pandemic. It has happened before COVID and for years and years in the past. If you see the, um, the reasons on the complaint on the right hand side, this is the gist of all the problems that the seafarers have been facing and the, and the photos and the pictures really do the talking. So we found the connection of the open registry. But what is the really, really the crucial connection here is that most important story is that the seafarers on this list are on any, any example you look, and they all, all come from this uh, third world countries or new labor supply uh, countries. 
you will see that they are from Philippines, they're from Panama, they're from Ukraine, Syria, Myanmar, Togo, Pakistan, India. Why? So I'm sure you'd agree that the ship owners are not choosing to abandon those ships which are having the third world country seafarers in them, but instead, it is the full storyline of how those unscrupulous ship owners who choose to register with flags of convenience do so to employ economically weak or vulnerable seafarers from labor supply nations. And when things go wrong, they just find it too difficult or even wash their hands off. You can see that there are concerns with food wages and long work use of a, and even abusive treatments. So the existence of substandard shipping practices only compounds the negative circumstances of seafaring, uh, particularly so because it seems to affect those least able to protect themselves because it affects those who are either politically, economically, or socially disenfranchised, most commonly due to economic circumstances beyond their control. One of my students is working on her doctoral study on seafarers' fear of criminalization, and you can see why that is a very important and pertinent topic. So now I turn to the final section. So but before I do so, I just want to conclude this section. So there are there are some serious issues which globalization has thrown back at us. It is a worry, something that overshadows the good things in terms of getting new job opportunities. I must mention that if you dig deep, you will see that in a good proportion of these cases, the charters of these poorly run ships and even the abandoned ships are big names based in the Western world. Perhaps some of the ship owners are also have the businesses in the Western countries. So sitting in the Western world, we cannot say it is not our problem. A lot of it is our problem. Probably it is created here in our backyard. But, and very importantly, I must also point out that the story is patchy. I'm not at all trying to say that we want, we should paint the same picture with a broad brush. There's a huge amount of variation and the variation among the new generation of ship owners variation among the open registries and even from the new labor supply nations. Let us now get, um, so let us not get dragged into the generalization here, but, but there is definitely a problem, a systematic issue that we have failed to address. In the final section, we want to see what is it that the industry has done to try and address some of these challenges. So, one of the structural peculiarities that stands out in the case of shipping as evidence is its ability to secure its regulatory of choice. Large businesses often have several regulators, but these regulators are largely based in the place where their plant, where their companies, or where their human resources are based in. For instance, in, if a DP World sets up a base of container terminal in Southampton, the company is going to be regulated by HSE in the, under the government of UK. But as we have seen in this globalized world, that may not be the case in shipping. You can choose your regulators. So in shipping, as the states which were the key players previously began to lose power and the power shifted to newer nations with limited experience, or expertise has given actually birth to a new form of regulation, which is widely known as the port ship control. Now this port ship control conduct inspections when a ship, a foreign ship calls their port. So they inspect the ship's papers and visually and any deficiency, the inspectors have a range of measure to consider. So around the world of a number of nations have come together and shared the data among them and they cannot escape the unchecked within a broader region. So the regions kind of come together. The one that we are in the UK that we are locally in is known as the Paris Memorandum of Understanding that covers, I forget how many states in Europe, but most of the states in uh, coastal Europe, as well as Canada. 
They're extremely effective due to the public nature of detailed documenting practices leading to naming and shaming, following up and reporting. It does so by analyzing the reports leading to the creation of detailed databases which can show patterns and prediction what to expect when a ship of a particular type of flag or age is about to visit the port. Port, port ship control have become the most effective source of truth which nearly every stakeholder refers to. In many cases, it is more stringent than what the parent flag states can offer. But of course, its effectiveness can be felt only when a ship visits other region of the world which are known for the portrait control stringencies. If not, you may be just lucky or unlucky, should we say, that you never get uh, uh, um, inspected by such portrait controls. You can see the comments on the right-hand side from my studies where portrait control has been praised by almost practically everybody and just goes to show that, you know, this is, this is, uh, this has been an answer that the industry has offered. Um, just two more very quick slides on portrait control. The portrait have created an annual listing of flags, the white and the gray and the black. I've taken some examples where you show which kind of flags belong to which of these categories. And UK, you can see, is at the top of the white. On the next slide, you can see that they have gone further and, and found out and listed publicly as to which types of ships have been detained and are currently detained and currently banned from visiting ports in the Paris Memorandum of Understanding region. And the list is somewhat predictable. So there is another, there is another form of um, uh, regulation. And in order to get the balance, we find that the, again, in the absence of a state regulation or, or the level of state regulation, we have seen that there, are, there is a, a, another void filler, if you like, the oil majors. Maybe, maybe you can, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones who actually look at the, look, look at the trade. And, and some, um, some people have called it the functionalist way where the oil and the gas carriers and the chemical carriers, which have considerable publicity in a lot of reputation at stake and choose to ensure that they are not caught out. So they have their own regulating system. And we'll all remember what happened to BP after the deep water horizon disaster in 2010. So the oil majors outsourced the transportation business of carrying the oil because arguably it carries the most vulnerable tag in his entire business link. But as the head of supply chain in the movement of a gas, oil, or chemical, there is the, these, the, there's the highly regulated and stringent inspection regime. Oil majors work wonderfully well, and you can see it from the comments on the right-hand side. They're overwhelmingly positive and, and, and in my study, I have heard it again and again, and they said that I am much safer on an oil tanker and possibly compared to uh, a bulk carrier. It shows that industry has found some ways to deal with this re regulatory gap created by the void created by the lack of state. And there are other measures too, and I do not have the time to discuss them all, but these include, for example, the classification societies, the insurance companies, the right ship, all of which occur, uh, which, which certainly routinely occur, and regulatory inspection and control is, is the way that we have, we have seen it operates. So, I am now coming to the final slide. And I'm, I, I, the, case, the case study of shipping is not the end in itself. Okay, I use the case study of shipping because it is a means to an end, a means to understand what happens globally. It is used as an empirical resource for exploring the wider questions and regulations. And we and academics, it's our responsibility to do so. 
It is where contradictions of regulations were most clearly exposed. What actually goes on there? We need to know that. And what goes on in the shipping industry, as we have seen, other sectors are likely to experience, if not all of it, certainly some of it. So for as long as global disparity remains in terms of concentration of resources in one area, regulation standards being different from one to the other, cost of living, wages, living standards, and compliance, and social support system, there remains the scope for engaging in globalization. The intent to make things cheaper and sell them dearer is not going to go away. In regulation, state's role is not limited to inspection and control, which is what the portrait control of the oil majors are able to offer. States can do more. Through the managers, they can offer effective consultation, training, support, coaching, and mentoring, as well as tripartite management with the trades union. We haven't had the time to go into the detail how the state system works as a holistic way in, which includes the other players in the sector, but certainly it is led by the state. But using the end of pipeline inspection system, such as those by the port ship control and the oil majors, it is more likely that the operator or the end user who is at the, at the, on the field, on the ships in this case, get penalized because the oil majors or the port ship controls are actually doing only inspection of the final product. It doesn't get deep into how the pipeline of regulatory compliance is actually taking place. So this in turn reinforces the blame culture that the operator is here to be blamed and that narrative only gets reinforced. So when the ships fail an inspection or perform poorly, we have seen the regulatory uh, and the seafarers um, uh, get the blame and often are left to fend for themselves. This confirms what should be termed as systematic failure. However, it is not the case that all territorial regulatory practices are safe and sound. In a, in a more traditional business model, states cannot always deliver for its citizens. Its ability to deal with forces of globalization is critical. Whenever capital power is able to set up a business in its territory, which generates good revenue for the state, but it is an industry which, which, is, which is relatively easily portable because the same level of resources are being offered at a competing place. The same state's ability to push for a higher level of workplace safety, compliance standards, or employment conditions are compromised. It reminds me of the Rana Plaza accident in Dhaka. I don't know how many of you remember, but it's in April 2013. It's a, one of the recent examples of mass industrial homicide, where around 1,100 people died and several thousands, thousands were injured when an eight-story commercial building collapsed while workers were making apparels for brands including Prada and Gucci and Matalan and Primark and Walmart and many, many more. It was the result of a catalog of failure, failure from the several government departments and political parties in Bangladesh. But also, the problem is in the entire pipeline. As consumers really remain keen to buy cheap goods, is produced, which is produced on a low margin and, and a threat of capital moving its production base somewhere else. In these circumstances, perhaps, could we think about having an oil major equivalent in this? We also saw the important role played by them and we argued that the regulation could be successfully offered by the functioning, functionalist way an industry as opposed to its territory based. So we are wishing for something other than the state here because as the photo in the photo you can see on my slide, that the state grossly failed talent. Perhaps the responsibility of regulation has to be more than just the state's responsibility. As a number of authors such as Braithwaite and Rehaus have argued that 
for a network of regulation is probably the way forward in which a multiple regulatory players are all kept in check by one another. So today, I think we have only just scratched the surface. Uh, there are shelves and shelves of books and journals with literature that we could have talked about, but there's not enough time. And, I, and, and, and we hope this presentation instigates academic debate and discussion on regulation and role of state and other matters of academic research generally in the university. And I, I end here and I want to thank you for listening. Thank you, Shamantak. Thank you very much for a really interesting and, and stimulating talk. Um, I particularly enjoyed it. Uh, and I can see that, that there are several questions in the chat. Um, so it, I, I don't know if you can see those, if, you, if you'd like to, to address some of those, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, okay, so I've got one question from Adam Lewis. I'm just picking at random. He said the list of Paris MOU banned vessels had a number from Panama. However, this is slightly predictable due to the sheer number of vessels registered there. Is there uh, like for like comparison with the average number of ships to register. I think Adam, that's a really, really good point, and I, I completely get it. Um, uh, and you're 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 spot on there. I, I I have to admit there is. I do not think there is an average number of ships per registry um, readily available, but I'm sure one can work it out. Got a question from Peter Lloyd. The next one: uh, Globalization seems to serve developing countries at a at the detriment of developing countries. What notable changes to changes to practice are happening to redress this balance? What isn't happening that should? Um, I think I think that's that's, that's a really good question, uh, Pete. Um, I think there are there are. The fact that we are talking about it is a start, uh, uh, and I, I think as as we as we have more academic voice about this, I think there is clearly um, there is the um, opportunity for um, greater change uh, shift in the policies, if we can, um, and we can see from what works in certain circumstances. Maybe um, there are there are things that we can't really all um, see first or appreciate without actually having evidences in certain circumstances, certain industry sectors, that it has it has worked effectively and indeed learn from them. I've got a question from Andrea. Right. Uh, why haven't we designated seafarers as key workers? I'm, as an ex seafarer, I think you will you will know my um, response to that. I feel uh, deeply saddened by that, to be honest. And I, I have still got colleagues and, and friends sailing at sea, and they have not been signed off. Managed didn't get a sign off for over over fourteen months, and they they didn't sign off for it. Um, but it, they're just carrying on. They've never stopped working in this 14 months. And I, I, I again think there's a possibility that the such seafarers are probably um, from those who are uh, the, probably from the nations who may not have all that uh, support and the backing that some of the Western world developed nations may have received more. And that is that is unfortunate. Um, I've got one question um, from Roger. Uh, he's asking, could you tell us a bit more about the role of the IMO and the member states? 
Um, um, certainly, I've got colleagues in the room. I'm sure they're they're also um, uh, might want to say something. But the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, is a specialized United Nations United Nations agency which works exclusively for the purpose of ships and all matters relating to sh ships. So um, the role of IMO is to ensure that all of the key matters in terms of safety and pollution prevention and the newer areas which are, which are growing uh, to take a position on this to support um, uh, discussion, facilitate and such that uh, and those those discussions often originate from the flagship, the member states, uh, who should be able to then um, the IMO um, then collects information, puts them together, has sessions, debates it, and finally comes up with um, a plan of action so that these uh, can be turned into regulations and and taken up by the individual flag states, so those regulations can be implemented. I, I can see I've got Brian here in this room. I wonder whether Brian would like to say anything to answer, help me answer this question and what happens in practice from, from the MCS point of view. I'm absolutely fine. I, 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 we can come back to you later. Um, I got a question from um, Debbie, so is it? Sorry, Sh sorry, Shimantak. Oh, right. uh, there was problems getting unmuted. The forum wasn't letting me letting me unmute. Which, can you just restate the question? Sorry, I was literally just uh, just typing. I think question. I think it's a it's a generic question, Brian. It says that uh, could you tell a little bit more about the role of IMO and the member states? Okay, um, so I guess uh, the sort of slightly personal impression. I mean, I think IMO sets the sets the baseline sets the baseline standards on this um, uh, and I think at the moment IMO is um, it's been keeping pace with um, change in shipping I suspect uh, in fact I know one of the concerns for IMO is going to be uh, as the pace of change in shipping accelerates over the next uh, uh, 10 to 20 years uh, I know one of the concerns of the IMO is how it keeps pace with that technological change. Um, I, I think it's an interesting topic you're picking up in the uh, in, in in the letter Shimantak, in the lecture sure. Shimantak because um, uh, I think the role of the state and the flag in setting regulation and setting standards is probably going to become more and more important rather than less important because uh, uh, the baseline lowest standards which is what the IMO sets uh, uh, we I suspect we'll want to exceed those across the sector sorry I hope that goes some way towards answering it thank you thank you very much thank you thank, thank you Shamantak I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt particularly as this I think this discussion is just getting going and, and we've we've got more questions coming in um, but I'm very conscious of the time and and I'm afraid I think we are gonna gonna have to wind it up there um, to finish in time. So before we do, I'd just uh, like to hand over again to Professor Karen Stanton um, to close the event today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Shamantak, on behalf of today's audience, can I thank and congratulate you for what was a really genuinely thought-provoking and insightful lecture. Audience, it's really difficult in this forum, isn't it, to be able to thank uh, and applaud uh, Shamantak, but if you want to pop your thanks into the into the chat or raise your hand, um, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Shamantak, you gave a really clear exposition of the challenges of regulation in the maritime sector, supported with some really dark statistics, and I think really demonstrating some significant uh, demographic disparities. I guess uh, I think a clear take home message for me today is, is really how the industry, how the sector can harness all of the advantages of globalization to deliver real ethical and sustainable practices going forward. And I know that will continue to be a focus, I think, of your, of your research. 
So thank you again for getting the series off uh, to such a great start. Thank you. So much. Uh, and to the audience, just to say finally, thank you very much for joining us today. We are genuinely delighted to have you with us. Um, we have future events planned. Please keep an eye on our website for our next lecture. Uh, we have Dr. Mark Aldridge on Wednesday, the 10th of uh, February, giving what will I'm sure be a really interesting lecture on Agatha Christie and Poirot, piecing together the evidence. So thank you everyone for attending today. I look forward to seeing you all again and I wish you all an enjoyable weekend. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay.